It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting, uh, either through my website, emailrevealer.com, or just give me an email, shoot at uh, oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. We're talking today to Robin Farzad, um, and he's written a book called Hotel Scarface, where cocaine cowboys partied and plotted to control Miami. And you can find that book at hotelscarface.com. He also has a radio show called Full Disclosure. Uh, you can find it at uh, fulldrradio.com. Uh, and you can also see him on, uh, contributed to NPR and MSNBC. Uh, Mr. Farzad, are you there? Yeah, how are you? I'm pretty good, pretty good. I had a little technical problems there, but we're good now, right? All right. <laughs> uh, tell the audience, who is uh, Robin Farzad? I am a business journalist. I'm an author. I grew up in Miami, Florida. I was born in Iran, and I spent much of my adult life chasing the story about this fabled hotel and uh, exclusive club and disco in uh, not far from downtown Miami. And I finally delivered it in 2017, and the book, as you mentioned, is Hotel Scarface. And it's called The Mutiny Hotel. Yes, uh, the Mutiny Hotel, which uh, people in Miami and people in Latin America and around the world will know it as kind of the Studio 54 of Miami. It's where in the late 70s and early 80s, before it was sold, it, it hosted all the celebs and cocaine dealers and spooks and private investigators and mercenaries and CIA types. It was this uh, uh, fancy aquarium where they kind of mostly all got along and they just watched each other. And the owner made a ton of money, and it was a cross-section of a city that was in many ways a, a boom town, but also a town in serious crisis. It was kind of, by 1981, the murder capital of the hemisphere. It's uh, nearly a failed state. And so I think that this property represents you know, the best and worst of Miami back then. Now, now from your picture, you appear to be a, a fairly young man. Uh, were you out and about during this time in Miami? No, and I don't want to give away how I found the place uh, because it's in the book if you're going to read it. But um, I, 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 I stumbled upon it right before I went off to college in the early 90s, the story. And uh, it's part of the book. It's actually how the book ends. I don't want to give that away. Uh, but once I realized that something like this existed in nonfiction, I had to have the story. I had to pursue all leads. And that took a long time, but I finally was able to deliver it and publish it in 2017. And the way we met is through uh, Ricardo Morales, uh, who's the son of uh, Monkey Morales, uh, famed CIA hitman. Uh, how'd you uh, develop a friendship with uh, Ricardo? Such a small world. I mean, he saw me after the book was published, post a photo of his father on Twitter, and he claimed it. I think we're both Miami Hurricanes fans. So we had friends in common. And then I, I learned that this guy existed. I couldn't get in touch with any of the late Ricardo Monkey Morales Sr.'s relatives, and he's become a, a, a friend and a you know creative co-conspirator and everything. And I kind of you know vicariously, his his late father informed so much of the book, kind of haunted the book. And he would speak to you in informant records and in uh, court testimony and everything. And this is a person who was killed in late 1982. But um, so many anecdotes from his son, as, as I'm sure are evidenced in your podcast. Yeah, you know, thinking back, yeah, that was an incredible story. Uh, the way his dad got killed us in kind of a, a shooting in a nightclub. Uh, but besides Ricardo, did you have other friends and associates in that world? None, none whatsoever. Uh, I was, uh, <laughs> I'm an immigrant honored, honor student from North Miami, and uh, I was going off to college, and uh, much of my adult career was up north in New York. But when the story found me, and I became an author, and I you know, became a, a, an investigative journalist. I just couldn't, again, I couldn't put it down. And that's the thing. It's about uh, persuading people who long since, you know, they've served their prison time. And most of these things are covered by the statute of limitations, right? And it's persuading them if, if one or two or three cooperate and have a good experience with you, then they're bound to recommend you to the other staffers and associates. And so, yeah, I spent at least a decade and a half cobbling the story together. And, and without mentioning any names, <laughs> any of these old retired smugglers you talk to are, are still involved in stuff? Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of this stuff has since moved to 
more savory white collar crime. If you know anything about Miami, I mean, yeah, go go take bootlegging back a hundred years ago, mm. and then you know, running marijuana, rum running to the Bahamas, and uh, human trafficking, and everything else, and pot and marijuana, all of that stuff mixed very well. But a lot of these, in general, I'm saying a lot of these people have graduated to uh, white collar crime and Medicare fraud and. And, uh, you know, crypto scams and everything else. I mean, the hustle is always on. Yeah, that's so true. I believe that the, the character that Scarface is based on, and now he, he sells exotic cats. Yeah, he's in the book. Mario Tabrawi would show up in, in his Mercedes with a chimp in the front seat uh, around the corner. He had a mansion with all these animals. And if, you know, I think he inspired uh, Tony Montana, as a lot of these guys said they inspired Tony Montana. But Mario, in his defense, if you see a picture of him, and I have it up on the Hotel Scarface site, in the late 70s, he's a ringer for Al Pacino's character. And we know that um, De Palma and Stone and uh, the, the various people who put this Scarface recreation together stayed at the mutiny, at the Hotel Mutiny, mm -hmm. and researched people. And the main characters of the movie bear a shocking resemblance. I mean, if you look at the late Frank Langella, was that right? Yeah. If you look at his resemblance to Carlene Casada, it's shocking. If you look at Monkey Morales' resemblance to the – who was the Oscar-winning actor from Amadeus who played the other hitman? I mean, you know, all these – the, it's shocking how much they look like each other. And Mario Tabrawi had all the animals, and he had a throne with the letters MT, and Tony Montana had the exact throne with the letter TM. A lot of these things. And, and if you look at the screenplay, it accidentally cues the Mutiny Club instead of the Babylon Club. So, mm. and, and, and the Miami Herald reported that they wanted to shoot it there. But, of course, the whole production was very much unwelcome in Miami by the exile community. In fact, they ended up shooting much of the film in Southern California. Really? I didn't know that. I didn't, yeah. I, yeah, I figured it was a film down in Miami. Uh, so what, was, what else was going down here at the uh, Mutiny? Well, for starters, it was a great place to blow illegal tender. It was mostly cash only. You could have a house tab, but no questions asked. If you're a Venezuelan oil trader who comes in in the late 70s and you try to order a bottle of Chateau Lafitte from some year in the 18th century or 19th century, and they say it's $30,000, you would have somebody courier the money over from a bank on Trickle Avenue and think nothing about it. You would think, you know, the, the, the suites upstairs – some uh, doper with the Medellin cartel in conjunction with one of the party people at the mutiny innovated the whole hot tub uh, full of champagne, full of Dom. And that doesn't really make any sense. It just burns your privates. It doesn't feel particularly mm. great. But it telegraphs to women and other party people that you're down to party and you have money. And uh, all sorts of things being spent. Celebrities there, Fleetwood Mac. The Eagles, who recorded in the recording studio next door, which was Bayshore Recording, the Doobie Brothers, the Cars. I mean, think about all we've read about Studio 54 and then add sex and intrigue and cocaine, violence and orgies to it and uh, the Cuban-American Susan, and you get what the mutiny was in, in its heyday. Yeah, how much of this was uh, driven by the, the Cuban uh, uh, refugees? You could not have written the story of the mutiny or the story of uh, cocaine in America without Cubans mm. because if we research cocaine – and I recommend this actually – this landmark issue of Playboy magazine, which is being circulated around the mutiny in like, – I think I have it right here. It's January of 1975. Uh, it was written – a very kind of sober piece about cocaine. It was this wonder drug. Dentists were – getting tipped in it uh people were using it you'd see people at book parties and salons in new york they'd be in other rooms you hear it snorting and it was very high class uh back then of course this was before crack and rebase and all of the violence that happened but to take it back to cubans this was it explains in this story how much of a delicacy it was in pre uh pre-communist cuba that um if you were there kind of in the 1940s and the 1930s it's it's a, it was a delicacy that you might see presented to you on a gold dish or a an ivory dish that corrupt judges and business people and everything they would call it postre pastry. Do so you want a little pastry with the you know the coffee that we end up having after a sumptuous dinner? And they toot this stuff, and it had the highest per capita consumption in the world. Fast forward um, 
Fidel Castro comes to power in 1959, and a, a lot of these indulgences were curtailed. But he flushed. He said he's flushing his his harbors of enemies of the revolution, many of whom ended up in Miami, and they were ticked off. And Miami becomes one of the largest, if not the largest, CIA stations in the hemisphere as we are training all these Cuban exiles to take out Fidel Castro, which they attempted to do, but with half-hearted support uh, in the Bay of Pigs invasion. I think that's clocked in 1961. And uh, they were taught the maritime arts evasion, I mean, smuggling, painting false water lines on shrimp boats. This was child's play for them. And a training ground of Florida with its thousands of miles of coast, of, of, of uh, you know, shoreline. And when the invasion failed, you had thousands and thousands of pissed off, orphaned mercenaries and people who were trained in the arts of smuggling and evasion and everything. And as they realized there wasn't going to be a rematch for Bay of Pigs and Kennedy was assassinated and the, the, the theater of battle in the Cold War shifted to South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, they turned to smuggling pot. It was child's play for them. And in the early 70s, you have this bet that kind of marijuana is going to be legalized, so you might as well make as much money on it as you could. And so some of the most adept marijuana smugglers in the United States were Cubans who were trained by the CIA, maritime Cuban people. And you advance that forward, you know, during the Jimmy Carter administration, many people are betting that this isn't long for the world. By the way, cocaine is much less stinky. It's much more profitable per kilo. Let's move to cocaine. And that's how the evolution happened. We ended up the United States ended up training some of the most adept smugglers in history uh, through our misadventures with Cuba. And a lot of these people initially, the old guard, the kind of the old money, they didn't want to be violent about it. But then the Colombians came in. The Colombians, of course, were the wholesalers from the Andes. But they needed the Cubans to move the stuff up and down the coast and to use speedboats and plane drop-offs between the Bahamas and South Florida. And then you have the Tony Montanas who came in in the Marielle Boatlift crisis of 1980. You had 120,000 Cuban refugees. Castro says he was flushing his toilets of these enemies of the revolution. Thousands of them were kicked out of uh, prisons and ended up in Miami. So the old guard Cubans and Colombians could hire hitmen and odd jobs people and smugglers left and right. And then you have the murderous era of cocaine really take over Miami. And that was what Scarface covered. Scarface was a depiction of that. It came out in 1983 where art was imitating life, if you will. Yeah, also the self-destructiveness of the addiction to cocaine, too. Your guys collapse. It's rise and fall. Um, you mentioned something about painting false water lines on shrimp boats. What, what was that about? Smugglers told me because the Coast Guard was always nominally on alert for people who were carrying heavy loads on a shrimp boat. I mean, impossibly large. You know, the bilge water full of shrimp and chum and everything could not possibly be making a boat look so heavy on the water line. So there was this trick. I, I interviewed a famous smuggler, Bobby Black Tuna, and they, they, would fa they, would, they would camouflage a water line, a fake water line on the I, – I, I I'm not that familiar with boats, but – to make it look lighter than it was to uh, Coast Guard people who were passing by these shrimp boats. And that was what you would do when you were pot smuggling. And it was one of the problems with pot smuggling. As the price tumbled, you had to kind of fill your boats and planes with more of this smelly herb to make it work. And that's why people wanted to shift to cocaine. I mean, if you could get a kilo of cocaine uh, wholesale from the Andes for something like $5,000, $6,000 by the time you cut it and adulterate it and package it up and move it up and down the street, it could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, you mentioned also, too, like a, a lot of these exiled Cubans went to work for the CIA. Uh, and, and when you talk to people like Monkey Morales, it seemed like you know, they were back and forth. They were back and forth doing CIA stuff and back and forth doing uh, drug stuff. Uh, how much is the CIA complicit in all this? The CIA, and I don't want to get killed for saying this, is quite complicit in it, especially if you fast forward to the 1980s, which one of the kind of the last acts of the Mutiny Hotel was hosting a lot of these characters from um, the Iran-Contra crisis. Very few people remember that this arms for hostages scandal, also one big part of it was the triangular trade of cocaine. Looking the other way as planes left um, 
you know, they arrived into Miami and much of Florida with cocaine and cash, and they were shipped back full of arms uh, to Central America. And the CIA looked the other way. There's this running joke in Miami that if you were a coke dealer who was busted in the, the 80s, you would invariably say you were working for the CIA. In fact, one of the main characters of this book, George Valdez, you can look him up. He testified. John Kerry got him to testify in front of the U.S. Senate in the late 80s. And he's saying we're all working for the CIA. And it's one of the main reasons why President George Bush, George Bush 41, took out Manuel Noriega, one of the first things he did in 1989, even though this was the same guy he was extolling when he was head of the CIA in the 1970s. Manuel Noriega was a great cutout person for the cocaine trade. Panama was, you couldn't have the South Florida and, and hemispheric cocaine trade without Panama. So it's all in the book. Yeah, the, the Panamanian banks at, at that period of time uh, were known for laundering money for us. Oh, they've been they've been known for a while for doing that, right? <laughs> no, but I, I think it, it stopped though. I don't think they're doing it anymore. Not, there was another it, scandal again. Another shoe dropped a few years ago with Panamanian oh, really? banks. I mean, yeah, you have to look askance. Miami banks. I mean, Miami has has been, I would argue, the hot money capital of the United States for the better part of a hundred years. Uh, whether it's hot real estate or dictator siblings buying. Uh, uh, expensive condos under shell company names. I mean, that stuff has just been happening for time immemorial. It just it, it morphs into the skyline, you know? Once again, we're talking about the book Hotel Scarface, where cocaine cowboys partied and plotted to control Miami. Uh, you can get that on the, the website, uh, hotelscarface.com. Uh, who, who from Iran-Contra was hanging out at this mutiny hotel? Um, you could take one character, Sarkis Soganalian, for example. He was the merchant of death, the arms dealer who was trying to supply, I think, Saddam Hussein and other regimes. He had a nearby uh, he had a nearby mansion where the after party from the mutiny would happen. You could look up Edwin Wilson, was the former CIA guy gone rogue. Um, one of the characters was E. Howard Hunt, which you might relate to the Watergate break in and everything else, and he became one of the cutout men to kind of stage this rematch with Cuban refugees. You know, the Cuban refugees who didn't get their rematch in Havana against Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro survived all of these U.S. presidents, they kind of got a sublimated rematch with Nicaragua and the Sandinistas versus the Contras. Mm -hmm. And the bouncer from the place, the doorman, uh, Fernando Puig, who was shot and killed, I believe, in 1982 – he was best friends with the former dictator of Nicaragua, Somoza, who was assassinated, and he allowed all of his coterie to come in to work for him at the hotel. So there were people in, in, in CIA circles, and of course the DEA and CIA and all these guys and the Metro Dade police always crossed paths. You could not, I mean, uh, uh, George Bush Sr. himself was there. Some of the Bush sons would come there. There were these people who were opening up savings and loan banks. It's really where all of these controversies kind of crashed in the lobby if you will bush sons which ones uh who was the one that had the savings and loan bank in texas the blonde one was it neil the one that got in trouble i think it was neil yeah neil there's also jeb bush who became governor of florida would hang out back in the day if you look for his photo he had a uh a, quite a mustache i don't remember if he married a cuban-american woman or a mexican-american woman uh but they do remember these characters a lot of these stories you know the more you talk to these people it's caught up in did it really happen or did I imagine it? And you have to be especially careful about verifying it with contemporaneous kind of stuff in the press. Pablo Escobar would stay there too. No, that brings up a good question. When these guys are talking to you, do you think they were exaggerating, puffing themselves up a bit? A lot of that time was. Like they would, they would have hated Scarface itself if you asked them in the early 80s. Uh, but then you ask them now, they're like, they take you to a cafe on Coral Way or some other place and they're wearing tube socks and they're well into their 70s and like you know tony montana was based on me hmm. and uh that's that's kind of beautiful that symmetry of that <laughs> that you know it, it, it took no time at all for scarface to become so legendary and they would all tell you like well oh, just wait when they make the movie about me you know scarface has become so iconic you see it quoted in sports center you wouldn't have had breaking bad without it it's been cited in the simpsons and family guy it's going to be 40 years old in December, and uh, to tell people that it was inspired by a place that actually existed, I think, blows their mind. 
Yeah, for the audience too, you mentioned uh, uh, E. Howard Hunt. I've had his son on the show a couple of times, and they actually murdered his mother too. You know, E. Howard Hunt's wife uh, in a plane crash. She was going to deliver some payoff money. Um, I didn't know. I know he had a deathbed conversion when he died in Miami, and he claimed he was linked to an assassination or something. Yeah. Look, I mean, E. Howard Hunt was one of the original members of this property. He 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 was in Coconut Grove before Watergate. I think he served some prison time in the mid seventies, but. Uh, he was one of the first members of this sedate condominium property called Sailboat Bay Apartments, which only morphed into the mutiny in the early 70s. The owner, Burton Goldberg, realized there was a great opportunity. The Miami Dolphins were Super Bowl bound. You had an oil shock bringing all sorts of wealthy Venezuelans and petrodollar Arab sheiks to Miami International. There was a lot of money to spend, and he picked the perfect time. You know, he said he wanted to open the Swingers Hotel, and sex combusted with that easy cash. And he opened this small members-only club and restaurant in the in the in the lobby, and it eventually annexed three floors of the place. And it was in position to pounce on all of the great money that came through Miami in the 1970s. What E. Howard Hunt? E. Howard Hunt was one of the first members of. I think he had an office, or I think he was one of the first members of the exclusive club. There was also a friend of uh, uh, Nixon's, a very close friend, B.B. Raboso, was sure. a bank manager. So these are names, if you look them up, E. Howard Hunt and his history in Coconut Grove. I mean, the wildlife of Coconut Grove in the mid-'70s. Uh, Crosby and Nash wrote a song about a place, the place called Mutiny at Sailboat Bay. Um, it was on a 1976 album called Whistling on the Wire. Neil Young wrote a song about it called Midnight on the Bay, which he wrote as he was sitting in the booth overlooking the valet. And he went up and performed the song for the staff, and they finalized it. In fact, the funny story from one of the bouncers is I always turned uh, Crosby away because he looked like a homeless guy. He was so helplessly freebased out. Mm -hmm. But then people had to remind me that he's kind of, you know, rock and roll royalty. And that, that was just the nature of the place. Coconut Grove was a hippie, sedate place. Wild peacocks running around and roosters chasing mailmen. And it turned into kind of the province of Tony Montana by the early 80s. Yeah, there's still places down here in Florida, Key West and uh, uh, Ybor City where the roosters were around. <laughs> like, yeah, very rare, few and far between. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what about, so you mentioned the E. Howard Hunt. What about Frank Sturgis? Because I know he had a Miami connection, too. Yeah, Frank Sturgis is connected to this place. There's a, I'm sure if you go to the Spartacus website, it's not hard to connect people like Monkey Morales or Rafael Villaverde, his table mates at the place the various Cuban cutout figures who were at the nexus of arms running and uh, cocaine and anti-communist activity in Latin America. Frank Sturgis is mentioned there. There was a, oh, guy, who was a mustachioed, um, shoot. One big episode we did was on Bernardo de Torres, the tall guy who's always been linked to the Kennedy assassination. And he was linked to an arms seller, probably you know the name, Mitchell Werbel. Sure. So these are not very familiar to me because at some point, you know, I, I've compared it to sipping from a fire hydrant there. If you draw connect the dots, it's so impossible to focus on any through line for the book. But, yeah, uh, Frank Castro, a major character, um, the Via Verde brothers uh, who, you know, they they were all prominent CIA people. There's no shortage of people. In fact, I tried to put up a cast of characters at the beginning of the book, but. It kind of works better with the index if you look at the back. <laughs> yeah, there's too many people involved. You know, Mitch Rebell, by the way, he was paid by uh, um, Larry Flint uh, to, to assassinate like you have to earn these guys, right? Yeah. And you, you heard that story because it came out in the FBI paperwork. Yeah, and there was another – Ricardo Monkey Morales came out and testified against his table mates because there was a botched assassination attempt. I think Edwin Wilson – and Frank, is it Frank Sturgis or Turple? Turple and Wilson tried to recruit a Via Verde. They thought they were being recruited by someone to go kill Carlos the Jackal, if I remember this correctly. And it was more of kind of a routine. Muammar Gaddafi wanted a political, uh, uh, political opponent killed. And that's when M Monkey Morales is like, I want to bust up this whole operation. And then he went to the Miami police and said, oh, I'm shocked and shocked that these people are going to trade heroin. But it was a farce, TikToks, by 1982, if you look it up. But it mentions all of those characters. Again, that's where these roads crossed. CIA intrigue, arms, um, the, the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, the rematch in Latin America, cocaine, 
uh, law enforcement where you purport to look the other way. And meanwhile, all these cocaine dealers claiming to work for the CIA. This is an incredible book. <laughs> I got to run out and get this book. But now I know from talking to, to you and uh, uh, Ricardo that there, there was going to be a TV show or a TV series about this. Uh, how, how would they ever let this hit the news? Hit the news? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. How, how would they ever let this go on TV naming all these names, uh, George Bush's son and all these, uh, these different characters? How would they ever want that to be publicized? Who's they? I mean, I don't know what matters anymore. Well, I was but, able to publish the book. I mean, yeah. there are certain things you can and can't say. Um, when, for example, Bernardo de Torres, who's a central character of the book, there's this guy who does – whoever does the Spartacus or Mary Farrell website says, whenever I've tried to post about Bernardo de Torres, this secretive CIA Bay of Pigs figure at the mutiny, Google would kind of shadow ban me or they would put it in right. the 5,000th ranking or something like that. And, uh, you know, here's a guy who died homeless three years ago. I get a, I get a tip from a friend in Miami, and there was no obituary. The Miami Herald didn't cover it. They're just things in Miami. You grow up there, you learn not to ask about. But for the most part, that era has shifted, and people talk. And the omerta of whatever was going on there, that's, that's so many presidencies ago, you know, the dark arts of destabilizing regimes in the CIA that – you could sketch something. I wasn't going out to kind of write a gotcha book where I was like, ha, 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 you know, you work for the CIA. It was more to give you a taste for what was wafting in the air in that period. And believe me, I'd have to write something the size of uh, the power broker, War and Peace, if I had to connect all the dots. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, what about a, a notorious character like Adnan Khashoggi? Yeah, Adnan Khashoggi, another figure, uh, cut out to this. Um, so he was connected to the Iran-Contra crisis, we know, a key cutout figure in this, and was mentioned in proximity to the Reagan administration and the first Bush administration. But here's the interesting thing. Adnan Khashoggi, I'm un I understand that he testified on behalf of Willie Falcone when he was sentenced. And Willie Falcone is the biggest cocaine dealer in Miami history. A lot of these guys came out and said they were patriots, that they were – if they were selling cocaine, a lot of it was with the salutary neglect of intelligence officials and Coast Guard officials so we could fund the anti-communist movement in Nicaragua. Unfortunately, he's passed away and a lot of these other characters, including Sarkis, have passed away. Uh, I tried to call Sarkis in one of his final years and he just laughed hysterically on the other end of the phone. It's like, you don't even know the half of it, kid. Um, whenever they were in prison, as uh, one of these prosecutors told me, they always laughed because they knew they had another card to play. Like if you press them hard enough on drug smuggling or something, they knew they had a get-out-of-jail-free card. And so they'd give you this smirk. And so, yes, he is mentioned, Khashoggi's mentioned. Um, if they kept a paper record of all the names of the people that stepped through this place, you'd be amazed. You know, Saudi princes, Kuwaiti princes, uh, some of them were scammers. Some of them purported to be bigger than they were and trafficked on this intrigue and this reputation. Bernardo de Torres, the people who partied with him, said that he kept a safe somewhere with photos from Dallas, you know. Really? And, and I met the guy and I was one of the only journalists he's ever cooperated with. And he always teased me with that, but he never showed me anything like the goods. He showed me checks from Garrison who was doing this investigation, and he said that, you know, people like uh, Joanne, who was the one who wrote the book, the Something of Justice, A Farewell to Justice, by his pursuer. When I first met this guy, he's like, oh, buddy, these people are just making money on me by posting me on Google, man. You're like my son. I'm going to tell you the real story. And there was never a real story. At some point, he asked me for $10,000, and I was like, I don't have that. And he, if he had a story, if he had pictures, he took them to the grave or in his case you know his ashes which are rumored to be sprinkled over the back of the mutiny any when you were snooping around trying to dig up information on all this any intimidation any kind of threats <clears throat> yes one of the uh prominent characters in the book uh is enjoying uh at a bar a hefty thing of rice and beans and plantains with me and tells me something and he says, okay, and, you know, we both had a little bit to drink. And if you ever publish that, I will hunt you down. And I look away and I look at his eyes again. I will hunt you down. 
and um, that's that's happened. The same person tried to, you know, he wanted to uh, give me an interview while I was watching a cockfight. Like he, they want to unnerve you and everything. And it was before, you know, I would take a rental car and GPS with me and try to give my brother my coordinates. But mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a lot of faith in the system. What about um, there's just a movie just came out recently about the cocaine bear? <laughs> Did you see it? I didn't see it. No. Well, because it's based on a true story. The, no, the, not yet. Yeah, Fuzzy Thornton. Uh, Fuzzy Thornton, uh, who died uh, jumping out of the plane there with a bunch of money and a bunch of coke, uh, was he connected to the? Um... No, no, he was not connected. What, to what about Grassi, Michael Grassi, the company? I, the company. I don't recall that being connected to this. The primary operation was Falcone Magluda, Willie Falcone and Sal Magluda, and you'll remember them from the latest installment of Cocaine Cowboys, Kings of Miami, on Netflix. These are the biggest dealers in at least Miami history, arguably U.S. history. And uh, one is serving uh, time until recently, you know, 200-year sentence in Colorado in the, in the Ad Max, and the other was just released. What about Operation Southern Comfort? I don't recall that. I I know Operation, to... There were Cobra, there was Operation... You know, grouper operations, TikToks. I've I've actually lost track. Yeah, because the guy who ran uh, Operation Southern Comfort, he was busted out of prison, mm. and he claimed it was the CIA that busted him out of prison. And they all seem to claim that. I would encourage you to read the book. You'll probably get a kick out of it. No, are you kidding me? I'm looking forward to it. Uh, once again, the book is called um, uh, uh, Hotel Scarface, where cocaine cowboys parted and plotted to control Miami. And you can find it on the website. Uh, HotelScarface.com. We're talking to uh, Robin uh, Farzad. Uh, let's see. Um, it mentions here in the description on Amazon that they had fantasy rooms, fantasy yeah. suites. Yes, this whole place, when it was converted to the Hotel Mutiny in the early 70s, Burton Goldberg brought in a very talented designer, Car- Carolyn Robbins. She said that the whole objective of this hotel is the seduction of the wealthy Latin male. So if they want to have fantasies, one should be the bordello suite, one should be Arabian Nights, one should be kind of a Japanese Shoiji motif, another one should be the jungle suite. Um, there's an anecdote I have from uh, a person, we didn't get it in the book, but was getting high with his girlfriend on the balcony uh, at the mutiny circa 1980, and... Um, uh, I think he was leaning on the balcony and then he fell below into another balcony and he thought that he had died and he was in purgatory or anything and he came to and he saw a bunch of people in an orgy wearing animal costumes like a lion's head, a zebra's head, a puma and this and he thought what the hell is going on? The next thing he notices is the dude with the puma head shows up naked standing atop him with this massive chrome plated gun hmm. and he's staring at the guy's package and this gun and all these people behind them in animal costumes it seems like something out of uh it was that kubrick movie his last movie eyes wide shut <laughs> eyes wide shut <laughs> and he's like is this hell is this purgatory what the f and then he hears banging and his girlfriend as his girlfriend's at the door realizing he fell in the suite below him and he's like they're like oh would you like to join in and they're like no i want to get my boyfriend and that's just that was happening i think in the jungle suite Right, so that was a fantasy. Um, <laughs> you can go and look them up if you would go to Carolyn Robbins' website. The Carolyn Robbins set designer, and she has all of the rooms from the mutiny, most of the theme suites. I think 130 different theme rooms. You mentioned a lot of musicians. <laughs> what about celebrities, like actors and actresses? Oh gosh, name the actors and actresses. There's Arnold Schwarzenegger. There was uh, the movie. Uh, you probably know it. Who was a uh, Oscar-nominated movie, Absence of Malice? So Paul sure. Newman and Sally Field. Burt Reynolds always trailing Sally Field because they had this kind of ill-starred relationship. People at the club remember when they were there filming Absence of Malice. Paul Newman, one of the big hostesses, said that he was like sh- as short as a jockey and. He would get so tipsy on the wine that she recalled moving him up to his suite, putting him on a swivel chair and pushing him in the elevator and tucking him into his bed and said, if my girlfriend could see me now, I'm tucking in Paul freaking Newman. Uh, Various Playboy Playmates, all of these newsletters from the era tell us about the celebrities that stopped by. Rod Serling gave his last lecture there before he succumbed to, I believe, lung cancer. Um, Who was the guy? What's new? Pussycat. Woody Allen? Oh, no. Uh, Who's the guy, the, the tall, 
the tall uh, Peter Sellers. Man. Peter Sellers. No, 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 no. The the singer. What? Oh, they have my dad. My mother loved that guy. Tom uh, Tom Jones. Tom Jones. When he showed up, the DJ said the disco. When the floor was the size of a the dance floor was the size of a postage stamp. He said, but the women went nuts when they saw Tom Jones. As I said, Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Nicks. Um, uh, the Eagles were all there. You would not believe the celebrity. Who's a who's a guy with a famous tan? George something. The uh, actor. George Hamilton. Yeah. George Hamilton and his sons and no shortage. It depends which which actor, which which staffer in the hotel you ask. Like I was propositioned by Don Henley. I was propositioned by this or uh, Rick James comes in and he was propositioning people. He was notorious for staying at this place. Various athletes. <clears throat> um, former heads of state, uh, Miss Universe. If you were anyone in Miami, and this was before Miami really, South Beach had arrived. South Beach was a destitute place in the late 70s and early 80s. It was an old age home for people, and it was really impoverished. And really the one hot thing to do in town was the mutiny, and that's where celebs stayed, especially next door. You know that Bayshore recording? It'd be uh, Eartha Kitt. Um, Gosh... You name it, they would stay there. Various hard rockers or, or wham. The the guy who ran the poolside tiki bar at the mutiny, the bartender said, I just remember these British, these two British kids coming up to me in 1981 and saying, we're going to be bigger than the Beagles, the Beatles. And next thing he notices is that they're on Dick Clark, you know, hmm. and uh, it's wham. It's George Michael and Andrew Ridgely, right? How much was a room <laughs> at, at, the, at the mutiny? Yeah, I mean, you could go back and look at the, the room rate, which was, I don't think it was more than a hundred, hundred and thirty, hundred and fifty dollars back wow. then. But if you were a Coke dealer and wanted to block off the really elaborate suites, you'd have to pay several hundred dollars. You'd have to bribe people to hold it for you. Um, it wasn't really the hotel that was making a lot of money. It was the club that was making money hand over fist. And it was a $75 membership, but really you had to grease the right palms to get in. There was a long, uh, you know, not unlike Studio 54, long winding line and valets and um, everything was cash only. Dom was a thousand dollars, you know, I'm sorry, two hundred and fifty dollars or whatever. The Lafitte Rothschild, a lot of the Cuban dopers who wanted to celebrate years before the Cuban Revolution, they would pay thousands of dollars for that stuff. And uh, the tips, the uh, waitresses, the hostesses would compete for the most generous tipping people. One of the one of the most popular ways of tipping was taking a uh, crown royal purple tote. Uh, you know, you know when those special ceremonial bottles come with the velvet yeah. purple tote, and uh, making a kind of an origami thing with fifty or hundred dollar bills and putting pure cocaine inside the origami and then putting that in there and tipping people to get premium tables for New Year's Eve and everything. And so. Tons and tons and tons of money was going through that place. The uh, the people behind um, the distributors of Dom Perignon visited in the early 80s and were shocked to see that the largest retailer of Dom Perignon on the planet was this exclusive social club and discotheque in Miami. What year did the mutiny uh, close down? Milton Gilbert sold it, I believe, at the end of 1983. Uh, by then, it was becoming pretty violent. There were a lot of you know, budding Tony Montana's, if you will. And, right. And the casual racism of, well, it's one thing to be high money, you know, Playboy 1975 cocaine. It's another thing to be violent guys who are killing each other. There were a couple of gun fights or bullets went off in the mutiny. There was a hostess who was murdered by a serial killer in 1981. Various things that happened. And also the cops got in the guy's ear and said, this place is too hot. You need to sell. So he sold at the top of the market. And the new owners came in, and they tried to clean up the reputation. And meanwhile, there were other very exclusive, i.e., non-Cuban, non-Nariel clubs opening up in Coconut Grove. And they had poached all the best people from the mutiny. And within uh, two years, it was a vic- the mutiny became a victim of the savings and loan crisis. It was seized and uh, shut down the government in 1987, which was, the government was a reluctant owner. And it was left abandoned by 1989. And um, I don't want to give away the end of the book, but uh, it was really well up by Hurricane Andrew in 1992. It became a crack den, a place where a lot of goth people in Coconut Grove would just hang out. I interviewed a woman who was homeless after the hurricane who lived there. 
Um, Marilyn Manson would party on the roof. It was a uh, very few people realized, wow, how is it possible that a crack den was once the most opulent place to party in Miami? We're talking to uh, Robin Farzad. Uh, the book is called Hotel Scarface, where cocaine cowboys partied and plotted to control Miami. Uh, and the website is uh, hotelscarface.com. Now, now, Robin, when you move around, sometimes it really messes up the audio with the, with the, the mic and stuff. Okay, I'll try to keep it still. There you go. I try to keep your head totally still. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, one quick question. Well, you know, what about Miami Vice? Uh, any of the characters from Miami Vice involved or, or any scenes from Miami Vice filmed over there? Yes, there were uh, a handful of characters. For starters, uh, the late Gustav Reininger, I believe he was a co-producer of the thing, said he went to do his research there, and he was interviewing dopers, and they were explaining how things happened. Uh, Don Johnson was one of the celebs who would stop by a lot. By then, the club had been sold, and it moved into kind of a second-tier status. But uh, Philip Michael Thomas, Tubbs, actually lived there. He took over the fifth floor with his pal... Glenn Fry, who used to party there as an eagle. And um, <clears throat> one other character, an actual cocaine dealer, Johnny Hernandez, uh, who I interviewed for the book, he explained that the makers of Miami Vice wanted a safer way to obtain cocaine for its ensemble cast instead of having them appear, you know, get busted on the side of the street. Yeah. And they bartered effectively. They put him on two episodes of Miami Vice. You can look him up, Johnny Hernandez. And uh, you can look up the famous Philip, uh, Philip Michael Thomas profile in uh, People magazine, either 1985, 1986. They interviewed him at the mutiny. Wow. And he, would, he took a stake in a, a crappy uh, car company. You can, you can look this up, too. It was called Machiavelli. Somebody at the mutiny had sold him, like, you could take a Pontiac fire, you know, what is it, a Trans Am, and we can make it look like a Ferrari. And he was a chief equity investor in that, and he always made it a point of parking his purple Machiavelli in front of the mutiny when he lived there. Incredible stuff. You mentioned here in the description on Amazon, uh, never before seen <clears throat> documents. What, what kind of documents? Are there documents in the book, and, and what are they? I tap them. I mean letters from people in prison, informant records, um, uh, testimonies that people gave that have since been unsealed or uncovered. And I kind of, I, I, I wove them into the book. Uh, this was a long search. You'd go and anytime the mutiny would appear, so many different scams hubbed and spoke out of this property in Miami in the late seventies and early eighties. So you try to incorporate as much as you could into the book. What kind of scams? Oh gosh. Um, oh, I mean, let me think of a let me think of a good one. There there are people that would, uh, for starters, cocaine dealers were always trying to get high quality product, and they called step on it with um, either baby laxative or powdered milk or other things. The Cuban refugees who were coming here, there was uh, a famous Mariel refugee uh, brotherhood uh, named the Boves, and they're in the book as well, B O V E, and they had a credit card. Uh, stealing scam, or they had a uh, they would they would steal statements. They would have a um, they had a record store, everything that would be used as a fence for equipment that was bought with bad credit cards, and they would sell behind the scenes. They were also dabbling in cocaine and Medicare fraud and in a bank. I'm sorry, gas station card fraud to uh, the people you know, the mortgage scammers, the everyday scammers in Miami who were there. The Ponzi schemers who would come from South America, uh, the Coke dealers themselves and the various ancillary scamps, uh, even the waitresses and others who were involved in certain things or being uh, front people to run uh, car shipments full of marijuana and everything up and down the coast. Uh, razzle dazzle scams. I mean, you, you just name it. The, any, any scam that emanated from Miami, any, any, you know. Money laundering, real estate scams, uh, horses, livestock, Medicare fraud, early Medicare fraud, corrupting judges. This was a place where it happened. How long did you spend writing this book? I spent a long time researching it and a good seven years writing it. Well, yeah, I believe that. But you, you sound like you have a lot more material of like maybe two or three more books. <laughs> and that's what kills me candidly. And I don't know yeah. who listens. He's going to listen to this is that 
immediately when the book came out, it was option for a dramatic series. And that went nowhere with the production company. And they made big promises and everything and other people called. And then that lapsed. And then Netflix, the people linked to Netflix, Narcos contacted me. And then they got a lot of information about it. Then they ghosted me. And then I signed up with a really talented uh, director who did Fear City on Netflix. It was about how New York broke the back of the mafia and i got in touch with him and we got him the book and we got a great documentary company in mid 2021 and they put together a great documentary proposal and nobody wanted it um i guess it was after netflix had pulled back and others it was just rejected by all the streamers and now i'm watching you know mgm plus which is owned by amazon some character some bit character's son came out and said that oh my father was the key man at, at the mutiny and we have a we have a series called Hotel Cocaine, and it's like it's like McDowell's in Coming to America versus McDonald's, right. and it's frustrating to see that. And Rick and I are frustrated because I spent so much time corralling the characters and the real story, and um, I, I just can't control Hollywood. It's a whole different metabolism. I the only thing I could control was my book, and I got to deliver really the book that I wanted to deliver. Yeah, and I, I, I hope you would uh, write more on this topic. Um, but just like I was saying before about how would the powers that be allow this to be on Netflix or HBO, um, just like they had the catch and kill with the Stormy Daniels deal. Uh, sometimes I suspect, because I have a lot of guests on this show that are up to stuff. <laughs> okay. I think they'll, then they get approached to sign an NDA. We got, we got this uh, deep, a movie deal for you. Uh, just c- kind of to silence people. I don't know if they would care anymore. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's why they didn't want to touch it. But they they've touched other things. Other taboos have been shattered. I'm not so sure. You know, the old dark arts of um, Iran Contra and Bay yeah. of Pigs. If anything, the, the thing that shocks us all is the lack of rapid declassification of some of the Kennedy assassination stuff, which is still galling. Yeah. Yeah, it just goes to show you. Yeah. Now, is there anything I haven't asked you about the the uh, cocaine uh, Scarface Hotel, Hotel Scarface, uh, where cocaine cowboys are partying and plotting to control Miami? No, you covered it well. <laughs> okay, great. Now, what about like the the uh, the, the police corruption uh, in Miami at that time? Yeah, think about it. If if you were netting a, kind of a gross profit of fifty thousand dollars a kilo for cocaine, or upward of a hundred thousand dollars if it was really good cocaine. A, a, a cop might be paid $22,000 in 1981 Miami or a judge is paid maybe a multiple of that. Think how easy it was to corrupt people. And then you did see many cops and judges. Uh, you could look at the Sweetwater Police Force. You could look at the Miami River cops, all of them who had a connection to the mutiny. Miami was a very corruptible and remains a very corruptible yeah. city because there's so much hot money sluicing through the place. And it takes a real true believer to not be to to re- resist the siren call of that money you know there was one guy one cop one undercover cop who was uh working in a van listening in on a bug to uh liza minnelli and her boyfriend who was a cocaine dealer from peru at the mutiny in the late 70s and in one of his later cocaine busts he says that I tried to put in for overtime for the cash that we have to spend all night counting. <laughs> and they rejected my overtime claim. And you got to think about that. It's, you, know, you got all this cash in your hands and why don't you palm a couple of hundred, three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars? No, I mean, they, they can't pay him overtime. Like he became, you know, sick on the smell of money. That's how serious it was. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of, I can, I can relate to that. Now, um, let me ask a question because right around, I guess it was like eighty two, nineteen eighty two, uh, all the the drugs were coming up through my uh, Florida, right? But then suddenly everything started going through Mexico. Uh, what are these old time uh, Cubans? What, what do they say? How do they lose control like that? They didn't lose control. In fact, they kept a lot. The, William Sal's cartel. I mean, the biggest, the biggest cocaine guys. They worked the Bahamas, Colombia triangular trade to south florida for as long as they could and they used speedboats shrimping boats and everything they could and when it shifted to mexico they had the 18 wheelers and they had planes and they had places that could get stuff in and out of the place they were very flexible and they were driven by the wholesalers in south america stuff 
was still being manufactured in the Andes if it was the Cali cartel and they shifted initial distribution to Mexico, you move to Mexico. You move people to Mexico. A lot of stuff was happening in California. Read the saga of Willie and Sal in the 1980s. It's in the book and it's in uh, Hotel, you know, uh, Cocaine Cowboys, Kings of Miami on Netflix. And this morphed until the government finally caught up with them and the big indictment came down in 1991. That's when the bill for this decade of excess was finally due. Ruben, uh, as far as I've only got a couple of seconds left, uh, why don't you tell people about your radio show? Yeah, full disclosure, it's my uh, show on uh, NPR member station, Radio IQ. You can get it on Spotify, NPR, NPR One. I just like to have interesting people on. It's, it's nominally about the business of culture and the culture of business, but we have entrepreneurs, authors. We've had Michael Mann, one of the creators of Miami, Miami Vice, Vice yeah. on the show. We've had many characters from the book on the show. Uh, this week, we're covering a lot of the banking crisis. Uh, we've had restaurateurs, comedians. It's, a, it's an omnivorous show. Hotel Scarface, where cocaine cowboys partied and plotted to control Miami. Uh, the website is uh, hotelscarface.com. Uh, full disclosure radio. Uh, Ruben Farzad, thank you so Robin, much. Robin Farzad. Robin Rob, Farzad. I, I blew it. Sorry. Robin Farzad. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.